for nearly two decades, one Boston neighborhood stood paralyzed by fear. Nobody would dare speak to police for fear of reprisal. Dangerous criminals ruled the streets with an iron fist while police watched helplessly. Without witnesses, many crimes went unsolved. Finally, in the 1990s, the grip of the community began to loosen and residents and criminals alike began to talk to authorities, thus breaking the dreaded code of silence. Pre-gentrification Boston was made up of a series of insular ethnic neighborhoods. And in these insular ethnic neighborhoods, they were very mistrusting of outsiders and authority. And there was no other ethnic group that came to Boston that was more mistrusting than the Irish. So it was natural when the Irish settled in neighborhoods like South Boston and Charlestown that they were very insular, not welcoming to outsiders, and completely mistrusting of the authority. So most people know that there's a code among criminals where you don't rat on one another, you don't work with the authorities, you don't talk to the police, but that's usually just designated to the subset of criminals that live into a community and are part of a society. It doesn't usually... That's not the code for the community at large. Usually if an average everyday tax paying citizen is wrong, somebody robs them or beats them up or mugs them or some, one of their family members is something bad happens to them, usually the normal thing for an ev average everyday citizen who's not involved in the criminal life would be to call the police and report a crime. But that's what made the neighborhood of Charlestown different from most neighborhoods in the, in the United States of America is that the average everyday citizens tax paying residents of Charlestown lived by this criminal code that these criminals were living by as well. And they were expected to uphold the code. And if they didn't, they were met with vicious reprisals. So of course, there's a couple different factors that contribute to this mentality in Charlestown of you don't talk to the authorities, you don't rat, that forces this code of silence. So one of the main factors was that the majority of people that lived in Charlestown were Irish American and the whole hatred of informers and not wanting to be an informer that comes all the way back from the old country like all the way back into what Oliver Cromwell was trying to invade Ireland and take over Ireland for Great Britain and trying to make the whole island uh, Protestant and get rid of all the Catholics so it comes from all the way back into old Irish culture about the great hatred and uh, distaste for informers and like People's family members wouldn't talk to them anymore if they were considered to be working with the English and stuff. And just this is like a deep-seated hatred for informers and rats and, and Irish heritage and culture. And then also another main contributing factor, as I talked about in the last episode, was down on the waterfront um, in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Tons of these longshoremen. We're talking about legitimate longshoremen, not hoods like the McLaughlins, guys that would just go to work every day. But... 90, I'm not going to throw, it's got, 9 out of 10 guys most likely were taking stuff out of the cargo and the freight. It was common practice. If kind of you weren't taking things out of the freight and out of the cargo, you were looked at to be kind of an idiot. Like, why aren't you helping yourself? Everyone else is. So it started in the old country, the, the hatred for the informers. But then when these guys came to Charlestown, they started working down the docks um, as longshoremen. Basically, you weren't supposed to tell on another longshoreman for stealing. If you did that, you were going to get kicked out of the union. You're going to be ostracized. You wouldn't be able to work down the docks anymore. Everybody in your neighborhood wouldn't like you anymore. And then two of these guys, they would bring back stuff to the neighborhood. And a lot of them would be giving, you know, food or alcohol or whatever they were stealing from the docks. They'd give them to their neighbors. And it was kind of, to, in one way, they're trying to be a good neighbor by giving their neighbor stuff. But in another way, it was kind of like, here, I'm giving you this. And you're not going to tell on me for stealing. It was kind of like hush money. So stealing a couple cans of sardines, a couple cans of tuna, maybe a bottle of booze here and there and bringing it back to the neighborhood and passing it out to your friends and neighbors. That's one thing. That's pretty benign, harmless stuff. And then most of the residents of Charlestown thought as well. And that's why they weren't going to rat people out. And they weren't feeling bad about, oh man, this is becoming a problem that's out of control. We should really tell somebody about it. No, nobody really cared. Especially as if their longshoreman neighbor were bringing back stuff in, from the docks and giving it to them, then they especially did not care. But after the 1960s, the McLaughlins got wiped off the map in their conflict with uh, Winter Hill and Somerville. But basically, the whole city of Boston took arms against the McLaughlins and wiped every single one of them off the map. So after that, there was really no organized entity in Charlestown after that. 
So going into the 1970s, the streets started to become a little bit out of control. Like the younger guys were being unruly. There was nobody really checking people or keeping them in place. I mean, this has kind of always been the Irish's M.O., is that they're kind of unorganized, unruly. They don't like to follow orders. They don't really have leaders, per se. Um, they're not structured like the Italian Cosa Nostra, and they are not able to have, like, a national syndicate where, like, their structure is completely different than the La Cosa Nostra. And, but the thing is, though, is Charlestown is different even for Irish. Because if you look at different Irish neighborhoods in Boston, you got, like, South Boston and stuff, it wasn't structured like Cosa Nostra, but Whitey Bulger was in charge of Southie. And basically people had to answer to him and he was controlling the rackets in that city and you had to pay up to him and kick up to him. That was really not the case in Charlestown. After the McLaughlins got knocked off, there was like there was still people that were bookmaking and loan sharking and doing the traditional rackets, but there was not like one guy who was like the godfather of Charlestown and everybody had to kick up to him. At least not in the 70s. So... A lot of these crews, these younger guys in Charlestown, they started to drift away from like the traditional rackets of the bookmark, bookmaking, loan sharking, all this stuff. And what Charlestown became known for in the 1970s was bank robberies and armored car robberies. And I'm not saying that these are the only, the only, <coughs> only people that did these jobs came from Charlestown. Because that's not true. There's neighborhoods all over the city of Boston that had great bank robbing crews. All of Massachusetts, I mean, there was a crew in my city in Gloucester back in the 1980s where a bunch of guys got popped for doing multiple bank robberies and they went away to federal prison. One of, the, one of my friends who, went, who I used to work for did 10 years in federal prison because he robbed a bank in Lowell in 1989. But Charlestown became, like, famous for this. There were more armored car robbers and bank robbers that came out of this. one Because Charlestown is one square mile. This neighborhood's one square mile big. It's tiny. So there was more bank robbers and armored car robbers that came out of this one square mile than anywhere else in the entire world. So robbing banks and armored cars became a tradition in Charlestown, became like a source of pride for these guys, like on how serious they took the jobs and how efficiently they pulled them off. And it was, they, these guys took it as like a profession. Like they were professional bank robbers and armored cars. Like these guys would follow like they would watch police training videos and see how police responded to bank robberies and armored car heists they would like case these joints out the jobs they would case the jobs out for weeks months at a time um they would like study the police calls for different cities to see how long their response times were for different things like they would call in fake crimes and see how quick it took the police to respond like these guys did not mess around um, it was passed down like generational. So if your father, your uncle was a bank robber, your older brother, a cousin, it would get passed down. So a lot of times it was like the family business. Instead of like being plumbers or construction workers and stuff, families would be bank robbers and armored car robbers. Now, I feel like Charlestown sometimes gets a, a bad rap. Like everyone from Charlestown was a bank robber or a crook or something like that. That's not true. Obviously, there was plenty of hard work and blue collar people in Charlestown before it got swarmed by yuppies and taken over. Um, not everybody was a bank robber or an armored car robber, but there was more of these guys in this one little square mile than anywhere else. And that's why they have such a reputation for it because it's, it's not, as they say on the internet, cap, it's real. These guys were the most efficient professional bank robbers and the FBI was like, they were such a thorn in their side because they couldn't crack a lot of these um, bank robbing crews because A, they were so good and so professional that they left almost no physical evidence at these jobs for them to be traced back to them, um, fingerprints, stuff like that. Uh, back in the 70s and 80s, obviously there wasn't DNA, but now they can tie stuff from old crimes to DNA that happened 30, 40 years ago. But these guys were so professional, they weren't leaving physical evidence and clues behind. And then two, the authorities couldn't get any help from the community of Charlestown. Nobody would cooperate or give them information or tips to help them in their investigations. And the local police knew all about the code of silence. And the FBI found out pretty quick when they started investigating these bank robberies and armored car heists in the 1970s. These crews would have all their bases covered. They had a guy specifically that would steal cars for the getaway cars. They would have like multiple switch cars. They'd do a, the job in a specific car, then go and switch into a different car. And then sometimes they'd even switch into another car after that, and they'd leave them parked in like 
strategic parking lots. Sometimes they would cut holes in fences, so they cut through fences and get to places that police couldn't drive to. They'd have to drive all the way around. So these guys were very efficient, very professional. The authorities had much disdain for these guys from Charlestown. So the federal authorities, their hands are basically tied. I mean, these crews are so professional. They're not leaving behind any physical evidence. They're not leaving behind any clues. They're certainly not getting any help from the community. If they're going around the neighborhood of Charlestown, knocking on doors, trying to get people to talk to them, people won't even talk to a federal agent or a police officer. Because if you were seen on the street talking to a cop or a fed, then your, your name is bad in the neighborhood and it's gonna mean trouble for you. Like, this is how serious the code of silence was in Charlestown. People were literally afraid they would not talk to authorities. So um, the feds and the police, especially the Boston police and the detectives, they knew a lot of who these guys were, they knew what the crews were, they knew what crews were doing what jobs, but just because you know something doesn't mean you can prove it in the court of law and get in a conviction. So like I said, these guys had their arms tied, their hands tied. Well, the vast majority of these crews that were pulling the bank jobs in Amakai Heist out uh, of Charlestown, these guys were professional. They took it like as serious as their day-to-day -day job because this was their job. A lot of these guys didn't have, I mean, some of them did have like, um, you know, they'd work as an electrician or a plumber. They had like kind of like fake jobs in the trades and stuff like that. But the majority of their time and energy was put into doing these big jobs. And that's where the majority of their income was coming from. And some of the guys... That's just all they did. They didn't have a, 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 any other type of front job. They were just bank robbers. So in the 70s, narcotics started coming into Boston um, in a much heavier flow. There had always been some throughout the 1950s and 60s. But in the 1970s, drugs started flooding everywhere. Every neighborhood of Boston and Charlestown was hit especially hard. And then it started making a lot of these crews... A lot of these crews would be maybe half guys are not getting high and half the guys are getting high. And anybody who knows if someone's using, they're unreliable, they're unstable, and that's when some of these jobs started getting sloppy and a lot of stuff started happening. And also, it was affecting the streets in Charlestown as a whole. Violence was starting to rise dramatically. Um, it was just the streets were becoming kind of chaotic and unsafe and the neighbors were really starting to like live in fear. And if you were just an average everyday tax paying citizen, <clears throat> you were nervous at night. Somebody was going to break into your house, try to steal stuff. You were nervous for your kids out on the street because you didn't know what was going to happen. You didn't want them getting involved in this stuff or you didn't want someone hurting them that was involved in this stuff. So towards the late seventies, things were just starting to become very chaotic in Charlestown. And it was in a big part because of narcotics. So now, besides the notorious bank robbers and armored car cr crews in Charlestown, where there's a demand, there's going to be a supply. So guys started pushing this product into into Charlestown into the, in the 1980s, and it wasn't necessarily like a situation how there was in Southie, where Whitey basically had his own little syndicate down there, and you had to sell his stuff, and if you weren't selling his stuff, then you couldn't sell at all, you know. And he was like taxing these guys' stuff. It wasn't anything like that in Charlestown in the 70s and 80s. But there was a lot of stuff moving into the neighborhood, <clears throat> into the city of Boston as a whole. Like the streets were becoming flooded uh, with the Peruvian marching powder. And of course, you know, guys who were maybe used to do banks or armored cars saying, hey, this is kind of easier money than doing that stuff. And they started pushing that stuff. And it was like different loose groups of people doing it, individuals. And then through the mid-1980s, some crews started to become more organized. And then one crew especially started to try to take over the city and started trying to push other people out of business that weren't affiliated with them. So seeing how much money could be made in the 1980s with this new booming market, some guys started to try to organize um, dealers in the city and then in the neighborhood of Charlestown and kind of take it over for themselves. So who I'm speaking of is Michael Fitzgerald and John Houlihan and their chief enforcer, Joseph Nardone. He referred to himself as their headache man. Any headaches that they had, Joe Nardone would take care of him. And Joe Nardone was a notorious guy in Charlestown. Because back in the early 1970s when... See, everybody remembers the busing crisis only in Southie. <clears throat> that happened in Charlestown, too. It affected every neighborhood in Boston, basically. So Charlestown and Southie were the two of the last white ghettos, really, in America, I think. I don't know any other large American city that had white, like strictly white, lower-class like ghettos. All the way up until the 1990s, Charlestown and Southie was like this. So if you're not familiar, in the 1970s, the idiot liberal uh, 
leaders of Massachusetts thought it was a great idea to integrate the segregated schools of Boston. So they took all the kids, the black kids from like Roxbury and Mattapan, the black neighborhoods in Boston, and they sent them to school in Southie and Charlestown and vice versa. They took the white kids from Southie and Charlestown and bust them into Roxbury and Mattapan where all the black kids were. So like they forced it upon people and it was awful. And, and most people remember in Southie, all like the white Southie kids, and that's why Boston has such a notorious reputation for being like the most racist city in the entire world, or it used to be anyhow. But so the, you know, all the white kids from Southie would be like harassing the black kids as they're coming into school. They'd be throwing stuff at the buses. The black kids would be getting beat up in school. It was just awful. It was, the whole city was in turmoil. It was a, just a dumb idea. Like, city is much different now, but back in the day, it was like so segregated. Every ethnic group and race had their own little pocket and area. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but to try to like forcefully integrate that kind of stuff, obviously that was going to be the result. So anyways, Joe Nardone made his reputation early in life as a teenager because while a big football game was going on in Charlestown between Roxbury and Charlestown, Joe Nardone with a couple other kids climbed up to a rooftop in a nearby building and with a sniper rifle blasted one of the Roxbury football players, this kid named Daryl Williams, and left him paralyzed from the waist down. And the guy was in a wheelchair for the rest of his life and ended up dying later on from complications due to the wound. But I mean, this guy was a maniac. I mean, in Southie, they were beating the black kids up in school. They were throwing rocks at them. They were harassing and stuff. This guy climbed up on a rooftop with a sniper rifle. Brought him to a whole nother level. So obviously... This gave him a fearsome reputation. People knew that he was not a guy to mess with, that he was somebody that would take it to the next level, no problem, no questions asked. So when Fitzgerald and Houlihan started their ring in Charlestown, they picked him as their chief enforcer. You gotta give it to him. I'd say that's a solid choice for a chief enforcer. Um, he was described as a squat, bull-necked man, and people on the streets were terrified of him. He went away for what he did to Daryl Williams. When he came back, he was a force on the streets, and Houlihan and Fitzgerald picked him up put them on their roster. So these guys, like I said, they saw the money that could be made from getting involved in this uh, lucrative market. So they started pushing it in, in Charlestown, um, and then they started to build their ring, and then they were trying to basically do what Southie, what Whitey was doing in Southie. They were trying to organize all the pushes and saying, like, you gotta work with us, or you can't, you can't be pushing your product in town. So they were running their operations out of Kerrigan's Flower Shop, which is like a small, short walk from the Bunker Hill Monument, right in the middle of Charlestown. And if this kind of rings any bells, if you've seen the movie The Town, the main guy that Ben Affleck is dealing with in the movie, you know, the, the big boss of Charlestown, the old Irish guy, he's running his operations out of a flower shop. So it's a little bit of fact with, mixed with fiction for the writers. I appreciate that. But in real life, Houlihan and Fitzgerald were running their operation out of Kerrigan's flower shop. And obviously the flower shop was a front. It was a legitimate business. You could go in there and buy flowers. But the point of it was to hide their underground business that they were running that was really lucrative. So... Like I said, there wasn't any organized entity in Charlestown. Most of these crews that were doing the bank jobs, they were like between three, four, five, six guys at the most. Um, but they weren't organized. Like they didn't have leaders. And then people that were on the streets that were pushing these different illicit products, they weren't really organized either. Maybe there was a couple guys working together, but usually it was just solo guys just doing their thing. So when Houlihan and, and Fitzgerald came on the scene, they started organizing this ring. Um, it was something different that was not seen really in Charlestown before. And they had it pre-set up pretty good. They had these guys at the top running things. Then you had Nardone as their chief enforcer. And he had this guy underneath him named Michael Nelson, who would become important later. And they had a series of runners that would be bringing the product to the customers. Like this guy George Sargent, who would become very important as well. Um, William Bud Sweeney. And even Fitzgerald's paramour, or his girlfriend, this girl, Jenny Rose Lynch. So he even has his girl out there running the streets for him. So they would, this was back in the late 1980s, so there was no cell phone stuff. Pages were just starting to come about. So the way that they started to operate was they were doing everything by pager, and they were giving customers specific customer codes. So you would beep the beeper and you'd have your own personal code as a customer so they would know it was you. Nobody could try to like page them. Like say if a cop got the page number by somebody, you couldn't just page the number and put in a delivery. You had to be like assigned a customer code. These guys were like very organized and very ruthless on the streets too. 
they it wasn't even these guys, the Fitzgerald and Houlihan, and now it kind of goes back and forth. The authorities say that Fitzgerald, even though Houlihan was kind of the more vocal, outspoken of the two and seemed like he might have been um, in control of the crew, the authorities say that Fitzgerald was the actual leader. Whether that's true, I'm not really sure. But these guys, you, it wasn't even about talking to the authorities. If you were just out on the street talking in general about them, they would come give you a very serious warning. And if you continued to talk about them or run your mouth about their operations, just in general, they would take you out. So this was a little bit of a change in how things worked. Because back in the day, people knew you weren't allowed to talk to the authorities, you weren't allowed to talk to police. But now with this new organization, just talking about them in general, whether it's just to another resident of Charlestown, if word got back to them that you were talking about them and talking about their business, they would come after you. And this was a new level of fear that was instilled on the residents of Charlestown, that they weren't even allowed to even speak about these guys or else they'd come after you if they found out. So gone were the kind of benign days, the harmless days of longshoremen stealing a little bit from the cargo and handing out to their neighbors. A little stealing on the waterfront never hurt anybody. But now, throughout the 1970s, it's like a dark cloud is beginning to hover over Charlestown. And a lot of it is brought on from narcotics. It was just bringing chaos to the streets. It was ruining a lot of the young people's lives, um, destroying families. And like through 1975 to 1992... Charlestown, like I said, a tiny little neighborhood, one square mile big, just a little pocket with a population of roughly about 15,000, which 97% of that 15,000 was white. So I'm talking about Charlestown, Southie being like some of the last white ghettos really in the United States up until the 1990s. So out of this 15,000 population, in less than 20 years, from 1975 to 1992, there was 49 homicides. What town or city do you know of a population of 15,000 that has that many? I can't name any. Out of those 49, 33 were unsolved. So roughly about three quarters were unsolved. That has got to be one of the lowest clearance rates in any large city. And Boston as a whole, especially in that time period, had one of the lowest clearance rates on homicides in anywhere in the country because nobody would talk. If they didn't See it happen to catch a guy red-handed committing the act. There was such a small chance of per prosecuting and convicting these guys because of the code of silence in Charlestown. Nobody would set foot on a witness stand and point the finger and say, yeah, I saw him do it. Because them, their family, anyone that they know or care about, their lives are almost void. You just could not do that. And these guys capitalized on the fear that was gripping Charlestown. In my opinion, they're really preying on the weak. They're preying on addicts by pushing this poison into the neighborhood. They're preying on the citizens, these families. They're saying, you can't say a word, you can't speak about anything we're doing, no matter how bad it is or like how much it's destroying the neighborhood. You're not allowed to talk about it. You can't talk to the authorities. If not, you'll be met with violence. So people were afraid. Um, they were starting to organize. They had a very, Intricate organization. They were running it out of Kerrigan's Flower Shop. They had runners delivering the products. They had customers paging these guys in their beepers with specific customer codes, codes for the quantity that they wanted. They were very territorial. They were basically saying, this is our territory now. And if you're an independent operator, you can't do business. And like I said, Fitzgerald, who the authorities say was the boss of the crew, his paramour, his girlfriend, Jenny Rose Lynch, was one of his top runners. So this kid named James Boyden, he was actually James Boyden IV. He was pushing the same product in an area that Jenny Rose Lynch supposedly was controlling now. And Fitzgerald gave him the warning, told him, cease and desist at this moment. This is my girl's territory. You are not to sell this stuff here anymore. Take a walk. Kid basically didn't listen. He refused to stop doing it. He kept doing his thing. And so then Joe Nardone paid him a visit. So unfortunately for James Boyd in the fourth on March 2nd, 1992, Joe Nardone caught up with him and ended his young life. Now his father, James Boyd in the third, I'm not sure if he had anything to do with the illicit things that his son was doing, or if he was just a grieving father in rage and wanted revenge, or maybe Houlihan and Fitzgerald just wanted to nip it in the bud 
and just not have to deal with him further down the line, wanting to get revenge again for ending his son's life. They sent Jonah Doan, who brought his main henchman, Michael Nelson, with him. And they caught up with James Boyden III just 10 weeks later on May 14th, 1992, and ended his life as well. So, can you imagine that? This poor woman, the wife of James Boyden III, she lost her son and her husband within a 10-week period. And this was the kind of stuff that was going on in Charlestown and pushing like the community to the brink about upholding this code of silence and being in fear of these hoodlums that were like basically running the neighborhood with an iron grip, pushing poison, getting their, their children, their brothers, sisters, uncles, fathers, mothers addicted to, to these narcotics. And then they're committing violence and people can't even speak freely. It was becoming like a very dark, scary place to live by the end of the 1980s. And this crew was ruthless. Like, if you did not heed their warnings, if you were trying to sell in their quote-unquote territory, if you were talking about them, whether it was to authorities or just people in the community, um, if you crossed them, if then, if then they started turning on people that worked for them themselves. Like George Sargent, one of their top runners, he ended up but he dug his own grave on this one. He got popped twice within a few month period in 1992. And when he got arrested both times, the police said that he willingly made statements against Houlihan and Fitzgerald. That they didn't even have to push him or threaten him with long lengthy prison sentences that he willingly made statements. So whether or not he was like fearful of these guys. He wanted to be underneath, to get from underneath their yoke. Or he was just trying to keep himself out of prison. I don't know what his reasons for, for working with the authorities, but he did. And some way or another, whether or not that Houlihan Fitzgerald got word that he got arrested and that he was, you know, not doing any time, or how they started to suspect him. But one way or another, they did start to suspect him. Now, George Sargent was given information to the state police about Houlihan and Fitzgerald, but one person he wouldn't say the name of was Joseph Nardone. I thought that was interesting, whether or not they were close friends or he was that afraid of Joe Nardone, he did not say his name. But he said a bunch of stuff about Houlihan and Fitzgerald, and he was giving a mountain evidence saying that they were the ringleaders of this ma massive trafficking operation that he was a runner for in, in the neighborhood of Charlestown. He tied them to homicides, both men. Um, but all this stuff was hearsay. There was no physical evidence tying George Sargent's statements so that the police could like actually form an investigation and get a you know, conviction against these guys. But whether or not Houlihan and Fitzgerald actually had contacts in the state police that let them know that he was cooperating or they just started to suspect him, maybe they were following him, whether or not they had a strong enough suspicion that he was working with law enforcement so they put the order out to have him taken out. So on June 28th, 1992, as George Sargent was walking outside of his house, he was ambushed most likely by Joe Nardone and the state police's best case of getting these guys off the street was wiped out. Now they had nothing. No guys in their organization were willing to work with them. And the citizens of Charlestown were terrified they wouldn't work with authorities. So after this happened, one of their other top runners, this guy William Bud Sweeney, came in and kind of confronted Houlihan and said, "What's go? What's going on? Is this something I should know about? Would you guys take? Why did you guys take out George? Did you guys take out George? Like, what's going on?" He was, I mean, this was his friend. He was part of the crew. He wanted to know, like, what is going on here? Is this something I should know? Basically, Houlihan gave him the brush off the cold shoulder, but they didn't like this. It's Jill and Houlihan said, "We can't have guys come in here talking back." It made them. A, they didn't like that. They thought that was disrespectful that he was going to come up and start questioning them and giving them an attitude about it. And B, they are like, you know, can we trust this guy now? Will he go against us? Will he try to set us up either with law enforcement or like maybe another crew, get us robbed, get us killed? Is this guy going to become a liability? So they decided to take him out as well. That's how ruthless these guys were. It didn't matter if you were part of their crew, if you were just a resident of Charlestown, your life was void if you went up against them. So they started hunting this guy, William Bud Sweeney. They tried three different attempts on the man's life. The last one leaving him paralyzed and then in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. And like these guys, like I said, they were just ruthless.
Also, just as a quick mention, I didn't realize back when I made the Butchie Doe video that this is the crew that he was beefing with because Butchie Doe was like a James Boyd in the third. He was trying to just join James Boyd in the fourth, sorry. He was trying to push his own product in Charlestown. He wasn't trying to listen to these guys saying, you can't do that. We run this territory now. So that's why he was at odds with them. And Joe Nardone tried to take him out twice in 1989 and ended up um, hitting him once in the neck. Uh, hitting this guy Jojo Burho was with him and this girl Maureen Simwitz that happened to be in the apartment just kind of an innocent bystander lost her life but I didn't realize when I was researching that video that that was the this was the crew that he was beefing with so it's kind of interesting so that was also a person that they tried to take out multiple times but failed to do so um, so in 1992 the crew's leader Michael Fitzgerald who unbelievably the whole time that he was out here running this massive trafficking operation and ring in charlestown and making all the citizens live the neighborhood living in fear he was on state parole that's right he was paroled from state prison he was doing all this while he was out on parole so for some reason in 1992 he violated his parole and they sent him back to state prison but he wasn't going to let that get in the way of him running his operation so he had this guy jim doherty in the flower shop, um, basically as his, um, I don't know what you call it, he was just like a puppet. He wasn't really, he was just taking orders from Fitzgerald. So Fitzgerald was calling him basically on a daily basis and giving him orders. And he was also calling his girlfriend's apartment, Jenny, Jenny, Lowe's, Jenny Rose Lynch, calling her apartment and talking to Nardone on the phone and giving him uh, orders and information. But what he didn't realize was that the authorities were listening to all these conversations and recording them, and they were starting to build a case against the guys. So as the authorities are listening to Fitzgerald's phone conversations, starting to build this case, Charlestown is just, they can't take it anymore. Like the community has just been torn apart with the narcotics that are moving through there. The neighborhood of Charlestown had roughly 50% more hospitalizations and narcotic-related deaths than any other neighborhood in the city of Boston. So they would ravage like no other neighborhood in the city of Boston by the scourge. And these guys are behind it, peddling the stuff, pushing it into the community. The community's had enough of living in fear and seeing the community torn apart by this poison that's being pushed in there. They're, the guys that are working for them, underneath them, don't want to do it anymore. They took out George Sargent, whether or not he was, he was working with the authorities. So... In the underworld, that could be a justifiable reason to take him out. But then Bud Sweeney, for all they know, is just he questioned them about why they took Sergeant out. And then they tried to take him out. Um, these guys are ruthless. People are working for them. They don't trust them. So now people in their own organization are starting to turn against them, which is completely unheard of in Charlestown. And Nardone's main guy, his main henchman, Michael Nelson, became a star witness for the government. So in 1993, everything started to crumble. The community was fed up, they had enough. This woman, Sandy King, who had lost two sons to unsolved homicides, started a group, a support group, called the After Murder Program. And it was basically for mothers and family members and basically anybody from the Charlestown community that was affected by unsolved homicides and they wanted some like resolution, some peace in their life. And this, of course, was like a very dangerous thing to be doing still back in the 1990s. People didn't want you talking about things like this and they would try to like scare these people. But these women came together and they said, that's it, we're sick of this. Like you've taken our children from us, what else can you take? And they just started standing up and like I said, people in their own organization started being like, this is ridiculous. What am I doing this for? Am I going to go to prison for the rest of my life? These people that will like take me out in a, in a minute. So the tide started to turn. And then 1994, the hammer came down. The feds launched this massive federal indictment against these guys, tried to take them off the streets. Um, Michael Nelson testified, tied Fitzgerald and Houlihan to separate killings. They said that Houlihan ordered the, the killing of Sargent and that Fitzgerald ordered the killing of Boyden III. And then Veronica Boyden and Marie Boyden, um, the mother and sister of James Boyden IV and the wife of um, James Boyden III, testified as well. So you had citizens and members of their crew alike all turning and they ended up getting convictions on all these guys taking them off the street. Joe Nardone, their chief enforcer, who is the guy committing all this violence on behalf of this dangerous um, trafficking ring, he was sentenced to life plus 65 years. So when the guy dies, he still owes 65 years to the government. So 
and basically the same year that all of this was going on in 1994, um, one of the most notorious bank robber and armored car thief groups crews in the neighborhood of Charlestown also met their demise. Anthony Shea's no-name gang, um, they ended up taking out, uh, robbery went wrong, and they ended up taking out two security guys, just nine to five working guys with families. And this is the way everything was going. It was just getting so out of control that members of his own crew, John Burke, who is Stephen Burke's brother, he was also a very active member of the crew. And he turned on his crew members and informed. And not only is that was unheard of in Charlestown, but he turned on his own flesh and blood, his own flesh and blood, his brother, pointed his fingers, brother, on the witness stand. And like in decades past, that would have been completely even unthinkable in the neighborhood of Charlestown. That not only a member of a crew would take the stand and point fingers against other members of his crew, but his own flesh and blood, his brother. They were yelling at him from the defense table, calling him an effing rat and threatening him while he was on the witness stand. It was just like an ugly scene, but it was really like the end of the era. You know, with community members, residents of Charlestown stepping up and not being afraid anymore and taking the witness stand and working with the authorities. Now members of their own crews, like Michael Nelson, and then John Burke turning against his own brother, not even just his crew members, but his own brother. It just really just brought down the whole wall of the code of silence. But I mean, this thing was so real. And then there was still little remnants of it left after that. But that was really kind of when John Burke flipped, when Anthony Shane and all those guys went to trial, that was a real like milestone for Charlestown when a, a brother would turn on his own flesh and blood and take the witness stand against him. That was like a real turning point. But there was still some remnants like left hanging out. Like Jim Houlihan, John Houlihan's son, that was nicknamed Jimma, he went after Patrick Knee. Now, I've heard that this could possibly be Patrick Knee from South Boston's son, or maybe it's just a common, somewhat common Irish name. But he was half brothers with James Boyd the fourth, and James Boyd the third was his stepdad. His mother was Veronica Boyden, his sister was Marie Boyden. So Jim Mahoulihan, I guess, caught up with him one night out in the street in Charlestown, and because of his family testifying against his father and putting his father in, life for, in prison for life, he attacked Patrick Knee, and the kid ended up dying. And to show you what a crazy small world Charlestown was, the girl that ended up walking up and finding Knee laying on the green, ground bleeding out was Eleanor Nelson, Michael Nelson's sister, who testified against Houlihan and Fitzgerald, like Nadone's main henchman, who testified against his own crew members. It was his sister who found her. And so they brought her forward to court and wanted her to testify because apparently when pa she said to Patrick Knee, oh my God, Pat, like who did this to you? And he said, Jimma. So somehow it got known to authorities that she, that he told her this and they called her forth to testify. And this poor girl, they put her in the witness stand and they, all they did was ask her a simple question. And she started, bro she broke down completely like crying uncontrollably, her whole body was shaking. They took a recess, and then Houlihan's lawyers argued, how the heck is our client supposed to get a fair trial after that display? Do you think any juror is gonna be not, <laughs> they're not gonna be swayed by that and to think that he's guilty, they're gonna be remain impartial? There's no way, but the judge upheld, they brought her back, she refused at first, she said, I'm not gonna say anything, so even after, these guys went away and the supposed code of silence was broken. People still were, like the old citizens of Charlestown, were still living in fear because they knew what could happen if you told. But then after a little while, they took a recess, she came back, and she kind of stiffened herself up. She said, I got a you know, kid to take care of. Because they told her, we're going to throw you in jail for contempt of court if you don't answer the questions. So she just said, I'm not going to jail for nobody. I got a little kid to take care of. So she ended up going forward and testifying that that's what Patrick Nee said. Like She didn't see it happen, but that's what Patrick Nee told her. And... The judge upheld it. They said that they're not going to throw the case out or select a new jury or grant a mistrial because of that. That it was just a, like it wasn't staged. It was a real thing. She was that afraid because that's what was instilled in these people from like the time that they were little kids. It's just, it was just a crazy mentality. But Eleanor Nelson's kind of breakdown on the stand and her fear 
of the reprisals and the code of silence of Charlestown. That was kind of one of like the final acts of it. And when they put these guys away and they put Anthony Shea and his crew away for life, um, that was just going to end the code of silence. And then once the millennium came and the 2000s came, Charlestown became gentrified as one of the hottest hit neighborhoods to be gentrified in the city. And the whole identity of the Irish blue collar working class and like the we don't talk to authorities, we not we're not we don't take kind to outsiders type situation. It's just completely different. Um, Charlestown is just a completely different neighborhood. But just a couple short decades ago in the 1990s, like I said, it was one of the last few white ghettos left in the United States. Um, small little community, one square mile with 15,000 people, one of the most dangerous, violent neighborhoods. And this code of silence was enforced like in no other neighborhood in Boston and maybe in no other place in the United States for that matter. So this was a good video to make. I really liked it. Um, put a lot of time and effort into it. Like I said, guys, I'm just for the time being, I'm probably just going to be doing one mob video a week. I want to make nice, good, long quality videos. Uh, there's no need to be rushing out stuff. Um, I'm, have a full-time job two little kids so one video of that's about this length and good quality i think this is really pretty good hopefully you guys are happy with that so if you guys like this video hit that like button subscribe if you're not already subscribed leave a comment make a request most importantly guys make good choices make good decisions take good care of yourselves your family your loved ones fellow human beings have a great day guys i'll talk to you soon god bless